WEVQ, Littleton 91.9. And online at nhpr.org. From New Hampshire Public Radio, I'm Peter Biello, and this is The Exchange. This week, we have heard hours of testimony from diplomats and members of the Trump administration about allegations that President Trump conditioned military aid to Ukraine on that country's launching an investigation into his political opponent. Today, a special edition of The Exchange, New Hampshire reacts to the impeachment inquiry. We want to know your thoughts on what transpired this week. What did you make of the witnesses, of the questioners? What questions do you still have? And if you were following the Nixon or Clinton impeachment inquiries, how do they compare? And were you keeping an open mind this week, or had your mind already been made up? Give us a call, 1-800-892-6477, or send us an email, exchange at nhpr.org, or watch a live streaming video of this radio broadcast at our Facebook page. Just go to Facebook and search for NHPR Exchange. That's all one word. And while you're watching, you can leave a comment there, and we'll bring that comment into the conversation as best as we can. Joining us for this conversation, Dante Scala, professor of political science with the Carsey School of Public Policy at the University of New Hampshire, joining us from the studios of UNH in Durham, and Dean Spiliotis, civic scholar in the School of Arts and Sciences at SNHU. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. Good morning. Hey, Peter. And listeners, again, give us a call if you would like to weigh in, if you have questions or comments. You power this program today, 1-800-892-892. Six four seven seven. Ahead of the program today, we did ask listeners on Facebook uh, this question. Are you following the impeachment? Why or why not? Susan said, yes. However, I do shut it off at times when it becomes an us versus them. This is about the country and about following the law, not about whether the Democrats or Republicans are right or wrong. Maria said, How can you not follow it? We are living in extraordinary times. The future of our country is changing before our eyes. You almost have to see it to believe it. And Elizabeth had this to say. Absolutely. Our entire family. It's thankful to NHPR. My 16-year-old was completely engaged in following yesterday's testimony. We don't watch it all. Just listen. I feel it's our responsibility to listen and understand as best we can. While complicated, it's not brain surgery. So... Listeners weighing in already. Uh, Dean, I want to start uh, with you. Um, How much do you think might be getting lost for people? I mean, this is a lot of information over the course of a week. How much can one person possibly absorb? Well, and if you if you fold in the amount of information flowing on social media in real time, uh, it is an incredible amount of information. And I think what is so uh, fascinating is that uh, uh, people are getting a a rare glimpse into the functioning of the executive branch. Uh, A lot of the folks who have tested Justified uh, over the uh, last two weeks from the National Security Council, from the Foreign Service, from our di- our, our various uh, embassies and uh, ambassadorial uh, posts around the world. Uh, these are folks that you might ne- not necessarily know or get to see. Uh, you get a sense of their expertise. You get a sense of their their uh, dedication. Uh, full disclosure, uh, my brother and one of my dearest friends are both former Foreign Service officers, so I've had a lot of experience over the years uh, learning about this particular culture uh, that was on display in the testimony. And, I, I, you know, for me, w- what was particularly interesting as a political science is the, the confl- uh, scientist is the conflict between uh, the presidency and the broader executive branch. It's true the president is the head of the executive branch, uh, but he's not literally the executive branch. And what you saw here is a trend that has been going on for uh, a number of decades now in which uh, presidents often pursue political goals in office. It, the presidency is a political office. You're an elected official. You're going to have political goals and interests, and you're going to typically rely on the people around you who pursue those interests on your behalf. The, the broader executive branch is something a little bit different. It has policy goals. It has continuity from one administration to the next. You heard a number of these folks in the Foreign Service and the National Security Council say they had served uh, uh, three or even four presidents of both parties. They view themselves as uh, nonpartisan. Uh, and so uh, we're getting a really interesting goal glimpse at the internal conflicts that occur within the federal bureaucracy uh, when you have a president who comes in and and, uh, 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 tries to shift that bureaucracy uh, towards a particular uh, policy direction. And that often happens. The difference here is the bureaucracy is not in agreement 
to a large extent, at least what we saw in the in the uh, testimony, with what the president's goal was, which was uh, this changing focus on Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we heard a comment from Susan who said uh, this is about following the law, not about whether Democrats or Republicans are right or wrong. So, uh, Dante, what is the point of the hearings? What is the goal? Is it is is the goal for both both sides to make their argument, but there's no truth here or actually to get to the truth? I think the goal is to get to the truth. And I agree with uh, both of you. I mean, there's been an extraordinary volume of information, but I think the basic facts of what occurred, uh, you know, the notion that the president of the United States uh, asked for a favor from the president of Ukraine in exchange for certain certain goods coming from the United States, a visit with the president, uh, military aid that was being withheld to be uh, allowed to go to Ukraine. To that, all of that uh, seems pretty clear, and the witnesses have, by and large, stuck with that same narrative. So I think the story is there. Uh, and so we're uncovering facts, but the other part of this, of course, is political, and that's important for, I think, all of us to keep in mind, is that impeachment is not, even though we equate it to a trial— it's not uh, it's not legal or you know a, a matter of criminal law. It, there's a real political aspect to this. And so one thing to keep in mind is has anything that anyone has heard this week and we've all heard a lot, has it changed people's minds uh, are and in particular, have Republicans changed their minds about, uh, whether the president is, in fact, impeachable or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want to go to the phones and bring listeners into this. Again, if you'd like to make a question or, uh, or comment, 1-800-892-6477 is the number, 1-800-892-NHPR. And let's talk to Jeff in Amherst. Jeff, thanks very much for calling. You're on the air. Yeah, thank you for, yeah, thank you for taking my call. Absolutely, uh, your guest is wrong. There were no facts there. It was all hearsay. There was absolutely no facts there. And for that, to make to make that point that it was, it's just categorically false. All the witnesses flip flopped on their testimony and it was all hearsay. And that's not admissible in the court. It would have been laughed out, laughed out of the courtroom. Now, you can say it's political. Absolutely. And the Democrats created a model that when the Republicans take the House, the next Democratic president, he will be impeached for jaywalking because you have destroyed the process. It is absolutely offensive and, and, and just disgusting. What they're going to do, it's no different than what happened in the impeachment with Clinton. It hurt the country. It was, it was not worthy of our time. This was even worse than that. It was a lower standard. Well, it Jeff, can I ask you about bar. your standards of evidence? I mean, what, what would be the bar for you? What would you have to see? to be convinced that, yes, the president did, in fact, condition military aid to Ukraine on a political investigation of a rival? What, what would you need to see to well, be you, convinced that there is actual evidence, assuming you are correct, well, and that there is indeed no evidence here? What well, would you need to see? Let's, let's, go with, let's go with the vocabulary. It was their perception. It was their narrative. Those are the words your guests used. It wasn't, this is the evidence. Here is the recording. Here are the tapes. You don't have any of that. It is all nonsense. You don't have any standard of any courtroom, not even a small claims courtroom, for the, the idea of evidence. That is the humorous, and that is why the American people have turned off this nonsense. All right. Well, Jeff, thank you very much for your call. Really appreciate your comments. Uh, Dean, your thoughts on Jeff's comments? Sure. And Dante may want to respond as sure. well. But, uh, uh, you know, what's so fascinating to me is there are two, two questions here. The first is the issue of, as the caller was suggesting, whether or not there is a, a pattern of facts that suggests this particular uh, exchange of, uh, of aid and a, and a visit for uh, these investigations. And then, and then the second question is going to be whether or not, uh, even if you establish that, uh, do people believe it rises to the level of an impeachable 
uh, offense. And so I've, I've heard a little bit of each from Republicans. Some Republicans argue as Je- I don't know that Jeff's a Republican, but some but I've heard from Republicans uh, that argument that uh, there's no evidence there that it's all hearsay. Uh, and then I've heard from others that, well, yeah, it was probably not a smart thing to do. And it looks like that's basically what he was doing. But it's not an impeachable offense. It doesn't rise to the level of of uh, high crimes and misdemeanors. And, you know, you go back all the way back to Watergate, Richard Nixon. The difference there was in, in August of 1973, you have the release of the so-called smoking gun tape, which is literally a tape of the president incriminating himself. Uh, in the uh, in the in the in the Watergate scandal, and so you know, for for the current case, we don't know, but it does, there does not appear to be any recording uh, of President Trump literally saying, "Okay, we'll give the president of Ukraine the money." Uh, and a visit if he opens up these investigations into Burisma and also the the Clinton uh, CrowdStrike server. Uh, it doesn't appear that there's going to be that kind of evidence. So no. everybody has a different level of what is, you know, is it good enough if somebody recalls a direct conversation with President Trump? You know, in the case of, of Ambassador Sondland, the EU ambassador who's in the middle of all of this, uh, you know, he talked about putting two and two together and, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, from what he could tell, that was what he was being instructed to do. He, and so, had, he had that phone call. And then so he testified to that phone call. And then David Holmes, a State Department aide, yeah. overheard, overheard that phone right. call. And while, yes, there is no um, actual like recording of that phone call, there are credible witnesses attesting yeah, I mean, part that it of the, happened. Part and of the, here's what right, was And part of the challenge here is just simply interpreting the testimony, you know, we, we can get into talking about social media and the way in which people consume information. Now, you know, 1973, the, the media environment was basically, you know, newspapers, three television networks uh, and public television. So everybody was basically kind of looking at the same interpretations. Now with social media, uh, people are completely siloed in terms of how they're all interpreting the same uh, testimony that everybody is watching. And so, so you know, you talk to Democrats or you listen to MSNBC and it's a slam dunk case and there's plenty of evidence. You listen to Fox or you uh, go to more conservative corners of Twitter uh, and you get the kind of response that we just heard from from Jeff. So this is a whole added level of complication. You know, we'll talk about Clinton a little bit later. Clinton was kind of in between. You know, it's not the 1970s with just a few television networks, uh, but it's not a full-blown social media environment either. It's somewhere in between. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dante, what do you make of, of uh, assessing what's true and what's not in, in terms of an, an impeachment inquiry? I mean, it's not a full-blown court thing. It's not, it's not a criminal case. That's right. What, what do you make of this? I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard for people to, to discern what's, what's good enough as evidence. Well, for one, okay, this didn't come all out of thin air, right? We, Dean's right. We don't have, an, as far as we know, an audio recording. But we do have a transcript of a phone call in July between the president of the United States, the leader of Ukraine, um, which uh, delineates something that appeared to be uh, transactional, where, you know, or the so-called quid pro quo. Now, I know there are different interpretations of that transcript, but it's just wrong to say that this is all being just made up and it's all hearsay and so forth. It all began somewhere, right? It began with a whistleblower complaint. And what the whistleblower had to say has largely been proven uh, correct by other witnesses or confirmed by other witnesses. And we do have the transcript, right, of the phone call which certainly raised alarm bells among Democrats and among Republicans. Now, that aside, there is the second question of, you know, now, given what we know now, is this impeachable? And that gets, you know, and there, you know, we can get into the weeds on this a bit, but it's not clear and simple uh, in the Constitution as to what counts as impeachable and what does not. And that's why... We have the, you know, the debate in the House and then ultimately if the House sends it forward to the Senate. Mm -hmm. Let's hear from more listeners. Uh, uh, All Things Considered producer and reporter Alex McCohen uh, took a walk around downtown Concord yesterday and she asked people if they were uh, following the impeachment hearings and what they thought. Uh, One of the people uh, that Alex spoke to is someone named Holly uh, on, on the question of what she thinks about the impeachment. I don't know how you answer this, but is how do we how do we filter out truth from fact, and what are the exact laws uh, around this? And if if this was if this is just bad form on the president's part, 
that's one thing. But if they're truly laws that have been broken, that's something entirely different. So, and this is exactly what um, Congress is trying to figure out right now. Whether laws were broken, whether impeachable offenses were committed, the word bribery has been tossed about. Whether or not that ends up as an official impeachment uh, offense uh, remains to be seen. The House Judiciary Committee will will take a look at that. Uh, Listeners, give us a call, 1-800-892-6477. Let's talk to Jeffrey in Portsmouth. Jeffrey, thank you very much for calling. What's on your mind? Yes. Uh, well, contrary to my friend, the other Jeffrey from Amherst, to me, it's very clear from all this testimony that what the president did was way out of bounds. But nevertheless, I think the way to get him out of office is through the ballot box and to send it to the air and to the Senate for an actual trial and all of that would be a fool's errand because we know the outcome ahead of time. So that's why you can say the way to do it is through the ballot box. The other concern I have is that a trial in the in the Senate would take four of the top six candidates, Democratic candidates, off the campaign trail for as much as two months. So to me, I would say that the House should just do a motion of censure and move it on and move on and get back to the business of government and we get back to the election. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Appreciate your comments. Uh, we also got a note from uh, Ivor or Ivor in Newbury. Uh, my apologies for not knowing exactly how to pronounce your name, but your comment was, uh, surely multiple obstructions of justice are sufficient to justify impeachment. Every blockage of response to the House's subpoenas is an example, and there are dozens of those, plus the one specified by the Mueller report, plus the inability of the ambassador to see his diary and notes. Uh, Ivor, I think, is referring, uh, Dante, to the the... The choice by some, especially in the Trump administration, to just not respond to the congressional subpoena and say, no, I'm not going to participate. The White House is telling me no. Um, Dante, is there any consequence for those who are subpoenaed by Congress and just say, no, I'm not going to do this? Well, that would be left up to the, you know, the courts to decide. I mean, that's the that's the dilemma that we're in. And you know, Dean mentioned earlier uh, the struggle within the executive branch between the presidency and then career officials uh, in the executive branch. And then there's another struggle going on between the legislative branch and the executive branch. So what happens when members of the executive branch, you know, working for the president, refuse to cooperate? And then the question is, you know, basically that's a decision for the judiciary to decide. And we're seeing that play out a bit with uh, John Bolton as to whether he's going to testify. And he, after what Fiona Hill had to say yesterday, I think people are even more interested in seeing what Bolton would have to say at this point, but uh, that is hung up in court. And that raises the political dilemma that Jeffrey mentioned uh, for the Democrats, which is we're awfully close to an election now where the people can decide whether Donald Trump should get four more years or not. And I can imagine voters sitting there saying, well, we don't like what the president did. We do think it was wrong. However, recalling the president, so to speak, which is what a conviction would do, uh, seems extreme to us. Why not have an election and let them decide? And so the Democrats find themselves now in a bit of a box as to what to do. If you expand the impeachment inquiry, let's say to include parts of the Mueller report, well, that's going to take a great deal more time. And then we can envision this impeachment proceedings going on to the spring, Mm -hmm. which would disrupt the process of the Democrats choosing a nominee to face off against President Trump. It's hard for me to tell, Dante, exactly who benefits and who does not from an extended uh, impeachment inquiry. On the one hand, a lot of it does not sound great for the president. But on the other, what you're saying, I think, is that it's distracting from other messages that Democrats are trying to put forward for the this very complicated primary process that we're engaged in. Uh, yeah. Dean, you wanted to weigh in. Yeah. You know, I talked earlier at the beginning of the show about the you know, presidents coming to office and they have political goals and they try in various ways to kind of slowly turn the ship of state in the direction that uh, that will uh, enforce their preferences. Part of the problem here in terms of this issue of whether we have hearsay or not is there's a whole level of key institutional actors just below 
below the president who are essentially refusing to testify and ignoring the subpoenas. You have Secretary of State Pompeo, uh, National Security Council Advisor Bolton, the Chief of Staff, Mul- Acting Chief of Staff Mulvaney. So there are a whole group of people who were, who were uh, 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 Vice President Pence, uh, a group of people who we know from testimony were kept in the loop, who would be the ones who would be the next step below the president uh, for uh, enforcing these preferences, and uh, and we're just not hearing from them. And I think that's that's uh, uh, part of, part of the challenge that uh, that we're, we're we're dealing with. Let's hear from uh, Nate in Farmington. Nate, thank you very much for calling. What's on your mind? Hey, um, actually, just kind of touched on it right there. Um, I've been paying a lot of attention to to the hearings from from the start, um, and what's been frustrating for me is that there are a bunch of people who would have firsthand knowledge um, and, and in reference to the, the hearsay argument, but they're not being allowed to come forward. Um, people who would either have that, that power to exonerate or, or condemn, you know, are simply not being allowed into the room or, you know, being blocked by by uh, the White House and, and the, the council. And, and Nate, are you saying this because you have not yet made up your mind or you think on principle everybody who needs to testify should testify or both? Um, a, a, a little bit of both. I definitely think um, all, all avenues should be pursued. Um, I, I definitely think that um, what what the president did was incredibly inappropriate and and could amount to an impeachable offense. But definitely, we it's it's you know essential to hear from from all parties. Well, Nate, thank you very much for your call. I should, really appreciate that. Dean, you yeah, want to say I should something? say, yeah, that there is a separate court case moving through the courts right now that involves the former uh, White House counsel, uh, uh, Don McGahn, and uh, his uh, ability, the ability of Congress to get him to testify. There may be a ruling on that sometime in the next week or two. That could have an impact in terms of how response to these other subpoenas are uh, uh, are uh, dealt with. Uh, but as, as of now, I have no expectation that we'll hear from these other individuals because uh, the president uh, will claim. Uh, some sort of privilege to keep them from testifying. All right. Well, this is uh, The Exchange. New Hampshire reacts to the impeachment inquiry. Uh, This is a listener-driven show today. We're asking you to call in with your questions or comments about what we've heard this week, and we have heard a lot. Give us a call, 1-800-892-6477. If you'd rather not call, send us an email, exchange at nhpr.org, or watch a live video broadcast of this radio program on Facebook. Just search for NHPR Exchange on Facebook, and you can comment in the comment section there as well. We'd like to bring your insights into the conversation as best as we can. Stay with us. We'll be right back. You're listening to NHPR. Good morning. You can support the news you trust and the programs you love with a year-end gift to NHPR. And when you do, you'll be automatically entered to win a five-night stay in Costa Rica, as well as our grand prize, a trip for two to Scotland. Don't delay. You can make your year-end gift now at NHPR.org. Support for NHPR comes from you, our listeners, and from New Hampshire Moose Plates, where 100% of license plate fees go to programs that support the state's natural, historical, and cultural heritage. Mooseplate.com. From White Mountain Oil and Propane in North Conway and Lincoln, featuring tankless water heaters providing over 8 gallons of hot water per minute, whitemountainoil.com. And from Grapponi Automotive Group in Bow, offering pre-owned vehicles in five lines of new cars, including Ford, Toyota, Honda, Mazda, and Hyundai, striving to serve with integrity, kindness, and respect. You're listening to NHPR. Welcome back to this special edition of The Exchange, New Hampshire Reacts to the Impeachment Inquiry. I'm Peter Biello. My guests are Dante Scala, professor of political science with the Carsey School of Public Policy at UNH, and Dean Spiliotis, civic scholar in the School of Arts and Sciences at SNHU. Uh, in just a little bit, we're going to be joined by NPR political correspondent Mara Liason, who can give us the view from D.C., uh, but we do want the view from New Hampshire, from you. And the number is one 800 892 Six four seven seven. You can also send us an email. The address is exchange at nhpr.org. And let's talk to Rudy from Pepperell, Massachusetts. Rudy, thank you very much for calling. What's on your mind? Thank you for taking my call. Well, there's a lot going on here. I mean, I guess the first thing is Mulvaney publicly admitted that they do this all the time. I mean, here's, here's his statement to, to the country. Uh, Trump also sent it to China. Come investigate. I mean, this is this is a time in our history where we have to. I think the Democrats have to plant the flag. This is a lawless president. This guy does not allow 
Pompeo, where you have Giuliani and his, his three amigos running wild in Ukraine, and going, you know, and, and then you have, you know, the Secretary of State people there trying to do something in Ukraine. And I mean, and, and this is all under the direction. I mean, what are people thinking about? You have to plant the flag. I know somebody talked about the elections coming up and everything, but when somebody does something wrong. You've got to do something. Otherwise, you don't know what this person's capable of. I mean, already he has pushed the inside of the envelope so that, I, you know, it's, it's, I mean, this is crazy. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's out there. It's, it's evident. So yeah, I appreciate you taking my call. Certainly. Thank you very much for calling, Rudy. And let's also talk to uh, Anthony in Milford. Anthony, thank you very much for calling. What's on your mind? Yeah, hi. Uh, what, I, what I'd like to know is how much money is this costing us between the Mueller report and the impeachment, and now I just heard on this program that with this, this, there's a possibility that this could go on until the spring. When is when are these people doing their jobs? Mm-hmm. They're, 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 you know what I'm saying? Uh, when are they doing their jobs? Are you wait? Are, are you saying that that conducting an impeachment inquiry is not doing their job? I, I think we spend way too much time. Uh, we. We spend way too much time nitpicking and criticizing and trying to find out, you know, what what other people have done wrong instead of doing they should pay more attention to doing their jobs. Thank you. I very, really do. Well, I'm not saying the, it's ridiculous. I'm not saying the impeachment is is ridiculous. Okay? If he did something wrong, okay, we do, we need to find out about it. But there's no con- there's nothing really here that says that he's done anything wrong for sure. I mean that that that's highly in doubt but I do want to thank you very much for your call Anthony. I really appreciate it. Uh Dean, what is it about the impeachment inquiry and, and, and as part of the job of Congress? I mean is it is it all encompassing or are they actually able to do anything else at this point? Well, I think certainly you're going to have a different you're, you're going to have a different legislative environment under an impeachment inquiry than you would otherwise. You know, Democrats have argued in the House that they've passed a variety of bills that have been passed onto the Senate and there really has been no action. I mean, there certainly is a sense that this slows things down. You know, people famously talked about the Clinton impeachment and and Bill Clinton's ability to compartmentalize. And I, I saw Clinton in an interview recently talking about his ability to, to, to move some legislation forward in Congress. Uh, but there's no, there's no denying, particularly in the current media environment, the current social media environment, uh, that this really becomes uh, uh, all uh, consuming. I mean, certainly 1998, was was highly polarizing. Uh, you know, it, the 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 House portion happened in the fall, right in the middle of a midterm election, and uh, uh, the GOP held on to the to to uh, 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 the House, uh, but they lost some seats, and Newt Gingrich ends up resigning. And the, so there's a whole, and we we uh, bombed Iraq. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on in the midst of the the Clinton hearing. Uh, the difference back then was, you know, we had uh, unlike the '70s where you just had the 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 networks. Uh, we do have cable news, CNN. Fox News is only two years old during the Clinton uh, impeachment, so it's a fairly new phenomenon. But we don't have social media. You know, the iPhone's not invented; it doesn't come out until 2007. So it was a somewhat, it was polarizing. It was a somewhat, uh, 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 you know, somewhat uh, uh, saturated media environment, but not the way it is today, where it just feels like you can't, you can't escape the crush of, of information. And so, so there, there, you know, there, and the other difference that I, that I, I had meant to mention earlier is that. Uh, neither neither Clinton nor Nixon uh, were going to stand for re-election. They were already in their second term, so you don't have this added issue of uh, an election. And and uh, you know uh, the the the, uh, the view that one caller mentioned about how uh, you know you have to uh, you know this is part of the job oversight and investigations and impeachment. It goes along with the turf, and you need to plant the flag. I think was the phrase that he used. But 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 you know, uh, one final thing. I, I you know in the you know, when I was teaching in the 1990s, I used a book called Politics by Other Means. Uh, and it was a book about precisely this issue, how increasingly, even back in the 1980s and 1990s, the power of oversight and investigations, the threat of impeachment, that, that this has become electoral politics by institutional means. So mm-hmm. people who are critical of this say this is an attempt to overturn an election. Now, that's a, that's a controversial statement, but, but that's one side of the argument is that Congress, that this ability to constantly do oversight and investigations and threaten impeachment has really kind of moved the electoral arena into 
our institutions. As I said, I mean, this is a book I used in the 90s. Right. So it's been and, well, it's one decades. way to look at it, right? It, yeah. The one way to look at it is that yeah. this is this is a, 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 an attempt to recall a duly elected president. Yeah, as Dante Yates mentioned the word recall earlier. And yeah. we'll, we'll get Dante's thoughts on that. But, yeah. I, I, but I, And it's also, one could also argue that this is a way for the American people to not be helpless if indeed the president turns out to be not what they thought he was or sure. she was. And, you know, you, you know, know? We, we can, you know, we don't know we have time today, but we can talk about the founders and their, their you know, their concerns having just come off of a monarchy, uh, you know, a decade and a half earlier uh, to put controls on uh, what they viewed as a potential, a potential for uh, autocratic power. And so that's why you have your Article 2. Uh, I think it's Section Four that talked about you know treason and bribery and high crimes and misdemeanors. So founders were aware of this uh, issue as well. Sorry, Dante, we're neglecting you. What are your thoughts on on, on impeachments or attempted impeachments past compared to what's going on right now? Um, real quick to uh, Anthony's question. So uh, the Mueller report cost nearly thirty two million dollars. I haven't seen any figures yet about uh, how much uh, it's costing the Intelligence Committee over the, the hearings over the past couple of weeks, but that was the figure that came out from the uh, for the Mueller report. In terms of impeachment, you know, it's it's again that now that the Democrats have launched this, what now is an increasingly pressing question, and um, you know, your caller from uh, Massachusetts. Right, talked about planting the flag and so forth, and so it's a real question about how much of a deterrent can impeachment be to a president, especially if it doesn't follow, you know, if conviction and removal from office does not follow from the Senate. So let's assume, you know, things play out the way I think most observers expect, which is that impeachment will be approved narrowly in the House. Uh, it will be entirely party line. Uh, I'm not convinced at this point there's one Republican in the House of Representatives uh, who will vote yes on impeachment. And then uh, it will go to the Senate, where once again, along party lines, it will fall far short of removal from office. So what what signal does that does the legislature then send to the president? Um, is impeachment without removal? a deterrent, or does it basically give the president license that, well, if you know, if we weren't going to remove on this, then maybe impeachment just doesn't work, period, the way the framers expected it to. Let's turn now to NPR national political correspondent Mara Eliasson, who has been following the proceedings all week. Mara Eliasson, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Happy to be here. So uh, was there one moment or maybe a couple of moments throughout this long week of hearings that stood out for you, maybe made you say, that's it, that's the argument in a nutshell right there, and it's it's at this point irrefutable? Was there a moment like that for you? Well, there were a lot of moments. I just want to say to, to your guest who preceded me, of course, I only heard the last couple of minutes of what he had to say, but I think I, I just wanted to respond to that because what's so interesting to me, I've been thinking about the exact same things, maybe impeachment in the House without the possibility of removal by the Senate, is tantamount to a censure. In other words, it's all the House can do. This is the only tool they have to hold the president accountable. But because everyone knows he's not going to be removed, it's the equivalent of, of a censure. But anyway, so moments that stuck out to me. Um, there were a lot of moments. I mean, the, the layer upon layer of corroborating evidence that, in fact, the president... Uh, did hold up the aid, that there was a connection between the held up aid and the um, uh, the request or the pressure to investigate the Bidens. That just built up over the course of the week. But I guess, I guess the moment that really sticks with me is from yesterday when Fiona Hill, who of course is the kind of uh, tough person who eats nails for breakfast, um, she laid out very, very clearly that there were two tracks going on, as she put it. Uh, Gordon Sondland and the three amigos were engaged in a domestic political errand. In other words, something that was designed to help the president's domestic political interests. But she and the other professionals were engaged in foreign policy, national security, carrying out the, the bipartisan-supported policy of the United States 
to help Ukraine defend itself against Russian aggression. And that, to me, was kind of it in a nutshell. Let me pause for a moment just to define a few of the terms. You mentioned three amigos. Those are, <clears throat> pardon me, Kurt Volker, the former special envoy to Ukraine, uh, along with Gordon Sondland, the U.S. ambassador to the European Union, and uh, Energy Secretary Rick Perry. They were allegedly under the direction of, or, or supported by uh, the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, to conduct a second channel, as, as you describe. And Fiona Hill, uh, formerly the top Russia specialist on the National Security Council. Uh, you mentioned uh, Mara Lais and a bit of her testimony yesterday. So let's hear a little bit of what she had to say. Some of you on this committee appear to believe that Russia and its security services did not conduct a campaign against our country and that perhaps, somehow, for some reason, Ukraine did. The unfortunate truth is that Russia was the foreign power that systematically attacked our democratic institutions in 2016. In the course of this investigation, I would ask that you please not promote politically driven falsehoods that so clearly advance Russian interests. As Republicans and Democrats have agreed for decades, Ukraine is a valued partner of the United States, and it plays an important role in our national security. And as I told the committee last month, I refuse to be part of an effort to legitimize an alternate narrative that the Ukrainian government is a US adversary and that Ukraine, not Russia, attacked us in 2016. These fictions are harmful even if they're deployed for purely domestic political purposes. When we are consumed by partisan rancor, we cannot combat these external forces as they, as they seek to divide us against each other, degrade our institutions and destroy the faith of the American people in our democracy. So, Mara Eliasson, to what extent do you think she was successful in, in breaking through what she described as partisan rancor and getting towards some semblance of the truth? Well, I think that she might have been successful on reminding Democrats and Republicans that they are supposed to agree that Russia did interfere. That is the conclusion of our intelligence communities. Devin Nunes, the um, ranking member on the committee, pointed out, well, we think two countries could have intervened. Um, but there's a big difference between what Russia did, hacking and weaponizing information, um, to what Ukraine did, which was pretty out in the open. They wrote op-eds. They were really worried about pres uh, candidate Trump becoming president because candidate Trump was very open about saying that maybe Crimea should belong to Russia. He hired Paul Manafort as his campaign manager. Manafort had been the political advisor to the pro-Russian deposed leader of Ukraine. His campaign intervened in the Republican convention to strike language in the platform that showed that the Republican Party was in favor of sending lethal military aid to Ukraine. So there were a lot of reasons for Ukraine to be openly working against Trump's election. That's quite different than what Russia did. Mm -hmm. And Mara Lyson, what do you make of the president's statements uh, through Twitter or otherwise uh, that he made throughout the hearing? Well, there were two real moments for that. One, when he kind of live tweet attacked Marie Yovanovitch while she was testifying to say that she was bad news. And she was the ambassador was to Ukraine who was recalled in yes. May. Yes. Everywhere she was posted, bad things happened. He blamed her for Somalia and Mogadishu. Um, but and, and that was something that Republicans, including Ken Starr, who has been a big ally of the president, Ken Starr is the former special counsel from the Clinton impeachment, he thought that was a big mistake. Democrats said it was witness intimidation. Maybe that would be another article of impeachment. But he did it again um, when David Holmes, uh, the political director of the U.S. embassy in Ukraine, was testifying about the overheard phone call, the phone call that he overheard between the president and Gordon Sondland, the ambassador to the EU, the president tweeted, it couldn't have happened. You can't possibly overhear a phone call that's not on the speakerphone. I've tried over many, many times to overhear phone calls myself. I know it's impossible. Um, the president believes that he is his best defense attorney, best press spokesman, best communications director, and he... Um, Number one, can't really control himself, but also thinks it's a really good idea for him to inject himself into these proceedings in this way. Most Republicans I have talked to disagree. And Mara, as the impeachment inquiry takes up so much oxygen, what are we missing? What big stories aren't getting enough attention right now? Well, every big story is <laughs> other than impeachment isn't yeah. getting enough attention right now. I mean, that's always the case when you have a big story. Uh, what's happening in Hong Kong isn't getting enough attention. What's happening on the Democratic presidential campaign trail isn't getting enough attention. But look, there are, we don't just have, 
you know, 20 minutes on the nightly news anymore. We have an infinite Internet. And all those stories are out there if people want to read them and consume them. Um, there are a lot of big stories. I think the the DACA case that's in before the Supreme Court is really important, a big political story. Um, but all those but impeachment isn't going to go on forever. And all those stories are going to be there when it ends. We mentioned earlier in the program that the impeachment uh, inquiry uh, and, and perhaps a, a subsequent trial in the Senate may last through the spring. Does that sound plausible and likely to you? Well, this is all depends on what Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, decides is in the best interests of his incumbent Republican senators who are up for re-election. Does he think a short trial is best for them? Does he think it's better to drag it out? The president himself has said he wants a full trial. He wants to be defended on the merits. What he doesn't want is a lot of Republicans saying... I think what the president did was wrong and inappropriate, but I don't think it rises to the level of impeachment and removal, so I'm going to vote to acquit. That's a pretty safe place for a lot of Republicans who are up for re-election, particularly in the two blue states, Cory Gardner in Colorado and, and Susan Collins in Maine. That's a pretty safe place for them to land, but the president doesn't want that. He wants people to say the call was perfect and he did nothing wrong. So those, you know, the decisions about how long the trial in the Senate should be remain, remain to be made. NPR political correspondent Mara Eliason, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate your insights. Thank you. This is a special edition of The Exchange. New Hampshire reacts to the impeachment inquiry. I'm Peter Biello. We will be back in just a little bit with Dante Scala and Dean Spiliotis and with you in your phone calls and emails and Facebook posts. Thank you so much for sticking on the line with us. We've got a lot of people in the queue, and we want to bring you into the conversation after a short break. If you'd like to join the queue, the number is 1-800-892-6477. Your burning questions answered, your comments uh, brought into the conversation after a short break. You can also email exchange at nhpr.org. We will be right back. Defense? We followed the president's orders. Attack. I want nothing. I want nothing. And interference. Getting caught is no defense. If you've been busy this week, it's time to loop you in. The Friday News Roundup next time on 1A. That's this morning at 10 here on NHPR. Support for NHPR comes from your listeners and from Listen Community Services, offering programs for those in need in the Upper Valley, including fuel assistance, a food pantry, housing assistance, and more. Listen CS.org. From Dana Farber Cancer Institute, bringing Dana Farber expertise closer to you, slash locations. And from the union leader hosting the Symposium Series New Hampshire Innovators event on December 5th at the Fratello's Restaurant, unionleader.com slash symposium. Mostly cloudy today with a chance of showers mixing with snow showers in the North Country. Windy today, highs in the 40s. You're listening to NHPR. Welcome back to the special edition of The Exchange. New Hampshire reacts to the impeachment inquiry. I'm Peter Biello, and my guests today are Dean Spiliotis, civic scholar in the School of Arts and Sciences at SNHU, and Dante Scala, professor of political science with the Carsey School of Public Policy at the University of New Hampshire, joining us today from the studios of UNH in Durham. And we're talking with you, and we're hearing what people from New Hampshire think about these, this week's impeachment hearings. Uh, earlier this week, uh, All Things Considered, intern producer Alex McCohen went out to Concord to talk to people about how they felt about what they've been hearing in the impeachment inquiry. And Alex spoke to Anne from Concord. I feel like there's not much I can do about it. So I'm listening to the reports at the end of the days and um, you know, getting the summaries. But... Um, yeah, I don't feel like there's much I can do about it. It's up to the people we elected. And um, I'm also just so turned off by the hateful rhetoric on both sides that I just don't want to listen to it. That's the comment from Anne in Concord. And again, listeners, give us a call if you would like to weigh in. one 800 8 Pardon me. 1-800-865-6477-892-6477. Pardon me. And let's talk to Bill in Kittery. Bill, thank you very much for calling. Uh, Hi. Um, Yeah, I think that the uh, Democrats have more than enough uh, evidence for an impeachment, uh, even for uh, obstruction of justice, because he won't allow witnesses to talk and 
intimidating witnesses with his tweets. But I think they'd be a fool to proceed with an impeachment. I think if it goes to the Senate, there's a, a snowball's chance, and you know where, of uh, them convicting him. And I think that if he is uh, goes to trial and is acquitted, he'll say, see, I'm innocent. I didn't do anything. I've been uh, pronounced not guilty and uh, continue to... Uh, the elections and uh, use that as a platform to get reelected. So, um, so, so this a Senate acquittal possibly good for a Trump uh, reelection campaign argument. Uh, thanks very much for your call, Bill. Uh, let's talk to Wendy in Nottingham. Wendy, thank you very much for calling. What's on your mind? Hi, I'm calling. First time caller. Uh, I listen to your program often. Um, I'm, I'm calling because just collectively as a family, I'm a, I have a husband and six children. And we took a chance and voted on Trump. We were we were skeptical. Uh, his behavior and some of the things that he his rhetoric was, uh, and but we took the chance and we voted. And we just with these impeachment hearings hearings and everything that's going on, we just feel like we did not get what we bargained for. And it just I think at the next election, I think there are just. Not just me, but many people in my community are like, this was wrong and we will we will vote differently. <laughs> mm-hmm. and Wendy, some folks have said that an impeachment inquiry is an unfair recalling of a duly elected president. Um, seems like you would prefer to just vote him out in the ballot box. But what do you make of that argument that, you know, it's it's just not fair to to throw a president out. He was elected by by the voters and he just needs to serve his whole term, regardless of how unhappy we are with him in this particular moment. Um, I, I, I just think we don't agree with this. We think that when when we elected mm. any official, we expect that they're going to collectively, um, you know, keep us safe as a nation. And you know, respect the Constitution, and and be held accountable if they don't. So you know, our feeling is, you know, we took a chance. He essentially it looks like now through this testimony has, you know, broken some laws, and just like any one, he should be accountable. And um, not that we have any confidence that a President Pence would be any any different, but. <laughs> Mm-hmm. We just, yes, we think that impeachment should proceed. Okay. Well, Wendy, thank you very much for calling. We really appreciate your thoughts. Uh, Dante, we know we have to let you off uh, off the line soon because you've, you've got a class to teach. Um, but, but tell us about what you will be looking for going forward. Um, obviously, the discussion, the public discussion about this is not over yet. What will you be listening for? I will be listening for any sign that anybody is changing their minds very much. Uh, One of the remarkable things about the Trump presidency, and that's saying something, right, because there's quite a number of remarkable things, is how little public opinion has changed about this president basically from day one, right? If you look at his job approval on day one of his presidency, it's basically a flat line from day one until the present day. And so, you know, is, is anything that anyone's hearing right now. And we need to keep in mind that most people are not as deeply immersed as we are, as Dean is, and so forth, in watching all this. Is this changing anyone's mind at this point, number one? Number two, uh, my uh, co-author, Henry Olson, who works for The Washington Post, you know, mentioned, you know, does impeachment cure what really ails us? And in his view, what really ails us is the political polarization that's tearing the country apart. Will impeachment, as opposed to an election, uh, alleviate that at all or just make matters worse, right? And that, uh, are people just going to get more dug into their positions as a result of all this? And would an election be a more effective way of making a decision given the times we live in? Dean, what do you think, uh, Dante, saying impeachment is is— a symptom, but there's a greater disease here. 
partisanship. Yeah, you know, we, we've talked about polarization, and you can go back to Bill Clinton's uh, impeachment in, uh, in in 1998, and I think about 30 or 31 <laughs> Democrats voted uh, to open the inquiry, but only five Democrats actually voted to impeach him. So the 1998 impeachment was also uh, tremendously polarizing and, and partisan. The difference now is the is the rise, as uh, as Mara Liasson mentioned, of of uh, social media. We talked about the saturation environment in terms of uh, information and how people consume it, and I think that has had a magnifying effect on uh, on our on our polarization. Uh, you know, this question about whether or not you should have an impeachment so close to an election. I think people are going to continue to debate that. It is in the Constitution. The founders were concerned about uh, an overreach of, of presidential power, given their experience with the British monarchy. So they put they put this stuff in Article Two. Um, you know, and I also, I also actually liked uh, Mara's uh, point about uh, about censure that uh, you know th- that this may be one way for the House to make a statement. Uh, without actually being able to remove the president. And how it's going to play out in the election, we don't really know. I mean, certainly President Trump, assuming he is impeached and acquitted, will campaign. Uh, saying that the whole thing was a, a sham and a witch hunt, et cetera, but that, by the way, he was also a- acquitted uh, by the Senate. Uh, but it's also going to be tremendously mobilizing uh, for Democrats and even for others. We heard Wendy, Wendy, I don't know her political affiliation, but there's somebody who probably will go out and, and vote against him the next time around with her family. So uh, we just have to wait and see how it, uh, how it plays out. The election is a complication, uh, but I don't know that it necessarily should preclude the the House and Senate doing what is a constitutionally defined uh, obligation. Uh, Well, Dante Scala, we know we have to let you go. Thank you very much for being here on the program today. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Have a good day. That's Dante Scala, professor of political science with the Carsey School of Public Policy at the University of New Hampshire. And let's go to the phones and talk to Jackie in Berlin. Jackie, thank you very much for calling. What's on your mind? Thank you. What is on my mind is the impeachment hearings. I've watched all of them, and I've followed them really closely. I'm an independent, and I voted Democratic in the last election. I, um, I, I have struggled with all of the issues, but I haven't been looking at it terribly legally necessarily, and until the last few days when I'm looking at some of the things that the Republicans are saying and trying to understand why they're saying this, because I feel like we're on different planets. Um, And I came down recently to thinking, you know, I think this issue of much of what's happened to this point and what's happening right now is due to the fact that we have different morals. And I think if you look at the issue on on a morality level, I can say that much of what Trump has done and the way he handles himself is uh, opposite my moral standards. And um, the moral standards that I have and have grown up with and developed on my own are not, of course, always equal to those of others. And um, so I, I think that there is, I'm very frightened for the future of uh, our country. I think that uh, we've been put in a really, um, we are, not we've been put, but we are in a really frightening situation here. And uh, I'm frightened for our country and I'm frightened for the effects that this is all going to have on the world ultimately. And so I'm not, I I thought, yeah, I'd like to go with, you know, Mm -hmm. getting Trump out of office. But now I'm thinking, I want him out of office. And if this is a a manner of getting him out of office, then take him out. But I don't want him in the presidency. I think he's harming our country. I think he's harming individuals. And I think he's causing harm to the world. Well, Jackie, thank you very much for your comments. I really appreciate your call. Uh, Let's also talk to RJ and where. RJ, thanks very much for calling. What's on your mind? Yeah, thank you. First time caller. Uh, I was born and raised in New Hampshire on a product of the New Hampshire public school system. And we were required to take classes like civics and U.S. history. We learned about the Constitution. We learned about how our country works, or at least how our forefathers intended it to work. They didn't have a closed loop on this whole thing. They kind of had an open vision. They knew things were going to change over time because things changed in their lifetimes. 
so they built this concept of let's balance out our government and make it unique, and we'll have three parts, and these three parts are co-equal in power. And in the administration, we're going to invest a lot of power in this guy or gal, whoever is the president, and there's a lot of discretionary powers given to the president. One of them is foreign policy. The president under the Constitution is the one who sets foreign policy, period. Nobody else within the administration, nobody else anywhere does. Now, we come to agreements about things, especially when it comes to things like foreign aid. Now, foreign aid has always been a quid pro quo, always been. We don't give money to another country just for the fun of it. We want something in return. Yes. So, so I'm, I'm sorry, could, could you express your, your, your point really, really quickly? Oh, my apologies. Oh, I, I think we may have lost you. I'm sorry. Um, we've got a comment from Donna in Jackson who uh, wrote in to say, what I haven't heard addressed is what precedents are being set with this inquiry and partisanship. When a different party is in power and the president, president sim- similarly uses or attempts to use aid to further a personal or political agenda, is it now acceptable? Is it now acceptable for people to ignore subpoenas without penalty? Is it now acceptable for a president to establish or use the office for personal agendas? That's the comment from Donna. And let's talk to Maria in Whitefield. Maria, thank you very much for calling. Um, good morning. I just wanted to kind of prompt everyone to think, what are we teaching our children during this process? What messages are we sending our children is this behavior acceptable and not acceptable? And how are you going to proceed in your life? Our children learn every day from what they see and what they hear. And I think the adults, we need to adult and realize, okay, we, in what we say and what we do, are teaching our children and what we allow to happen by other adults and not question sends children's message that it's okay. So when people say, should we impeach, should we not impeach, if there's an offense, definitely, and inquire, definitely. I don't, I personally don't think the House will ever impeach, but I really think the message should be when people do something, they should be held accountable. And we, that's what keeps us all in check, all of us, every day. And that's what we need to teach our children. We have laws to follow. Well, Maria, thank you very much. That, that, that might be a good place to end our discussion on the air today. However, online, this discussion is definitely going to continue on our Facebook page, NHPR Exchange, or at our website, nhpr.org. Dean Spiliotis, quickly, final thoughts from you about what you'll be looking for going forward. Yeah, well, we're going to wait to see what happens with the House Judiciary Committee. It looks, it seems like the Intelligence Committee uh, is finished. They're going to issue a report. It then goes to House Judiciary. They can uh, draft articles of impeachment. They can bring in more witnesses. So we don't really know exactly yet how this is going to play out. So I'm waiting to see basically what the what the next step will be. Well, Dean Spiliotis, Civic Scholar in the School of Arts and Sciences at SNHU, thank you very much for joining us today. We appreciate your insights. Sure. My pleasure, Peter. Thanks also to Dante Scala for joining us earlier in the program, Professor of Political Science at UNH. Thanks also to NPR political correspondent Mara Eliason for joining us for a little bit. Again, the conversation continues. My only regret this hour is that we could not have two hours because there was so much to say about this. Uh, The Exchange is a production of New Hampshire Public Radio. The engineer today is Dan Colgan. Our producers are Jessica Hunt and Christina Phillips. Senior producer is Ellen Grimm. Michael Brindley is our program manager. Thanks to All Things Considered intern Alex McGowan for heading out to the streets with a microphone to ask listeners what they have been thinking and feeling about this impeachment process. Rebecca Lavoie worked the cameras today. Our theme music was composed by Bob Lord. I'm Peter Biello. Thank you very much for listening and have a great weekend. (laughs) 